Hey everyone, what's up? This is Tom Matelski, aka IB True, and I'm with my co-host Evan Pollinger. What's up, man? Hey guys, how's it going? All right, so um, this is our second episode now. Uh, we're trying to do it monthly, so um, this should be our September one. We might get to another one by the end of the month, so we'll see how things go. For episode two, we wanted to discuss um, the top five cards. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry, the uh, top card of each color. Um, including lands and artifacts that Evan and I can see as being very fringe playable. Um, and we kind of wish were playable. So we'll go through that list. And then we want to do a uh, deck tech um, on some um, on blue, white, black stifle knot and some tech that Evan and I added together um, that I was able to do a four Oh finish with in the mythic society tournament. Um, but Evan, what have you been up to, man? What's going on uh, magic wise and, and stuff like that? Uh, nothing much, just absorbing as much pre-modern info as I can and trying to coordinate EDH games with my friends. Um, I'm in that group and I have not been able to show up. Um, <laughs> my bad. I wasn't, I wasn't throwing anyone under the bus, but. You're like the other, the guy maybe not playing is on this podcast. Um, yeah. But no, all good, man. Yeah, I know we've, we've all been busy. It's been crazy. Um, but yeah, so uh, with me um, trying to play every Wednesday and Friday in the uh, Mythic Society tournament, it's a four-round Swiss, and then you get store credit to their website. Um, it's awesome. It's good competition. Um, and then uh, the monthly tournament that is run by the pre-modcast guys, they do it through Facebook. Um, it's my second one. I did the last one for the first time. I was on Psychotog. Um Went three two. I think that was my record, but had an awesome time, and uh, just had the month start now, and I am currently one and zero. So hopefully this one goes a little bit better. Um, but sweet man, yeah. So let's let's just jump into it and break down this list. Um, and I'm glad I got a new microphone now. It doesn't sound like I'm in a wind tunnel <laughs> talking <laughs> talking through here. That was terrible, but I uh, got that all situated. But all right, Evan. Yeah, you want to start us out, man? Like, I'm I'm excited to talk about this, and and glad that uh, glad we can bring this to the, to the community. All right. Well, we're gonna start with white, and for I'm gonna go first with my white card, which was Glow Rider. And for those that don't know, it is a creature cleric, cost a white and two, for a two one, and it says non-creature spells cost one more to play. Now, I feel like this card is real close whether See? it's you know some sort of a hate bears or death and taxes it's like right there we know this card was very good in white eldrazi i think you when i was playing that in vintage um maybe about a year year and a half ago i was taking white eldrazi seriously i almost played it at the vintage champs um i went i was the one like adding in glow rider like it wasn't in anyone's deck list and i was like wait a second this is another thorn or sphere. So I was like, why are people not playing this card? I went from one to two to three to four. Um, yeah, man, it's so close. It's so close. I, I just don't know if there's enough supporting cast to actually make it playable in pre-modern. Yeah, that's exactly how I feel. I mean, we were talking about it briefly before we started recording. You know, what direction do you go with this? I mean, you obviously have Sphere of Resistance to try to, you know, add the extra thorn effects to the game. You know, do you go with Black White to try to have Hand Disruption with like Ravenous Rats or, you know, with the Rats Cabal Therapies? You know, where does the top end go after you have Glow Rider out? You know, do you go with red to try to go with a tangle wire with like welder or something to try to just lock him out of the game? I mean, you do have access to Rashad and Port and Wasteland in this format. I know you, you are a master of uh, like tax style decks. Like I remember when you had your uh, Duretti EDH deck, it was like you lock everyone out and no one can play. Um, yeah. <laughs> so I know when I saw Glow Rider on your list, I was like, yeah, this is like, this is your bread and butter. Um, so I, I knew you would have like the talking points with it, but as you mentioned, as you mentioned, it's probably just, uh, it just does not have the supporting cast in the format, but it might be a good thing. It might be a good thing. Yeah. I mean, the other option that I was even thinking about too, is you just go like some sort of like maybe blue white clerics or something, or like some blue white humans type of style where you have like meddling mage, 
you know, where meddling mage is your, you know, your two drop, and then you have into glow rider as your three drop. I don't know. It was something along those lines. I feel like it's real close. Like somebody somewhere has probably already been trying to get this card to work. And I feel like it's close enough where if the right person hits it, I mean, even uh, now I'm thinking about it like avalanche riders as a four drop right behind this. That would be insane. I mean, again, you're a better brewer than I am. Um, so I, I know you would have more insight with that and that off the top like that, that's a great example. And that, that would be so insane. If you went um, glow rider into avalanche riders, that's like probably enough. Um, yeah. Depending on the situation of the board state, but that's like a really good like line. Um, all right, cool, man. Um, do you have anything else you want me to jump into mine? Nope, go for yours. All right, so my white card is mobilization. Uh, for anyone who doesn't know, it's two and a white for an enchantment. It reads, um, attacking does not cause soldiers to tap, but in n new magic era, it is uh, vigilance. So all soldiers would get vigilance. And it has an ability of two and a white, uh, colon, put a one, one white soldier creature token into play. So I know uh, in standard with Onslaught, this card was fantastic. Um, I have a near mint crimped one. Um, not to say that because of my collection, I'm adding them in, but um, the artwork is, is great and the card is strong. I feel like it would slide right into um, standstill. Evan, what do you think, man? Like, am I, like, would that be the deck forward or do you, or do you build a new deck? Like, I just, it's probably just too slow. I'm, I'm not sure. Yeah, I mean, it's definitely, I mean, it, it would easily, at least I see it easily fitting into land still. I mean, there's maybe some like big mana blue white control deck that uses this as like, you know, make make a chump blocker or, you know, just as a mana sink, like a mana, just sink all your mana into it later in the game. If you're not casting, you know, force of, or uh, factor fiction or, you know, uh, accumulated knowledge or something, it's just a, a mana dump. But there's a chance, too, that you might see this go a different route where it goes tribal, where somebody manages to fit a literal tribal soldier's deck. And whether it's main board or sideboard, I'm not really sure. I mean, it could be, I know we talked about it, maybe a sideboard option for like a, a soldier's deck to have against other fair decks. So that way they get the ability to attack and block against like goblins or something. That's what I was thinking. Like I'm picturing it in like uh let's let's just say it has its own deck. Like it's like a I don't know, a blue white control deck or like maybe like a, tr a like a mono white Tron list. So like you revolve it around mobilization, you control the board, like, like this against goblins, you you lay down your mobilization and then you just control the board and you keep making chump blockers. I don't see how they're going to win. Um but probably too slow. Again, it's just like I feel like it's not good enough, but would be sweet if it was seeing play. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's a sacred Mesa, and we already saw that that card is playable. It sees some fringe play, right. and this card is right alongside of it in terms of, like, comparison. Exactly. Yeah, they got the pros and cons. Mesa's probably just better because they're flyers, but it does have the downside, too. So, I don't know. It's, it's one I want to keep in the back of my mind, like, where I, I could see it sliding into, like, my, like, like a, like a landstill deck, but I'm not sure if it would fit in the 75, but... Um, yeah, that's me for the, for my white card. Uh, what's next? Uh, we're, so we're going to move on to blue and I mean, I couldn't stay away from my controlly tempo style roots and my blue card is prohibit, which is an instant that costs a blue and one and it has a kicker of two colorless and says counter target spell. If it's converted mana cost is two or less. If you pay the kicker cost counter that spell, if it's converted mana cost is four or less instead. I, when I first got into this format, I saw Mana Leak as the, you know, the premier counter spell. I was super happy about that. And immediately I said, where's Prohibit right behind it? I couldn't believe no one was playing it. Yeah, it's weird, man. I, um, I feel the same way, like not, to, not agreeing to agree. Uh, Mana Leak is like an excellent card. That also got me really pumped up when I realized Mana League is like the go-to counter because it's such a good tempo card. Um, sometimes it's not even dead late game. It's such a good counter spell. Um, but yeah, Prohibit's an interesting one. I, I don't know. Like, obviously it's got like limitations, but it's basically Mana League <laughs> like early on. Um, I don't know. It's interesting. But again, maybe it's just like 
you do play it in a deck like a I can see I can see it fitting into Psychotog. Um like you could play like a one or a two of maybe it's like a sideboard card, like a, a like a one of extra counter you bring in, like like forbid kinda. I feel like forbid you can't play it in the main board, but it can be a sideboard card, you know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. Like you you'll bring it in against the control decks or like the combo decks. Um Yeah, I mean even prohibit against any of the you know, the low CMC decks, you're gonna have a hard counter that doesn't require you to be in double blue for their entirety of their deck for every spell. You know, you know what I'm thinking? If there was like a deck besides Psychotog, like, uh, cause Manalik is like a perfect counter spell card for Stifle Knot. Um, I feel like Prohibit can fit in there too. Cause the double blue is rough. So um, like I can see Prohibit in, in those type of decks where it's like, they're the blue XX or blue X decks and they, play prohibit with mana leak too because obviously mana leak is just a better card but i mean that prohibit is like probably right now af- right after it if you're not counting not counting counter spell i'm just talking like the one blue mana well and even like you said counter spell is hard to get to the double blue <clears throat> it's true yeah i've i've been i've played land still before and i got like a counter spell in my opener and then i'll have the land like you know the land hand of uh dust bowl plains island and it's like you know i, I wish <laughs> this might be it wish this is prohibit it would be nuts like nuts right now yeah I mean, the other thing too is, is, you know, if you're looking at mana leaks in your hand and your opponent is playing, you know, whether it's rebels or any kind of sorts of plowshares, you know, control deck and you try to mana leak it like, well, they've got like five or six lands, your mana leaks doing nothing. Yep. You could play prohibit. I'm not saying play it over mana leak, but you could have have a prohibit in that situation where you prohibit, you know, the swords on your, your dreadnought and suddenly you're in great shape. Yeah, no, exactly. And again, we're acknowledging that Mana Leak's a better card, but Prohibit is like also good. Yeah, I'm surprised it doesn't see more play. But um, I think, again, from time to time, it pops in for like, it, it'll pop into those decks like Psychotog and, and uh, like Stifle Knot. Um, all right, my blue card is Bribery. So um, Bribery is three blue, blue. It is a sorcery. Um, Search target opponent's library for a creature card and put that card into play under your control. That player then shuffles their library. So I picture this in like uh, Landstill and you bring it in against like Reanimator. Um, Oath. Oath, yeah. You're going to just bring it in against those creature decks that are trying to cheat like a big fatty into play. I don't know. Like maybe, like you, you tell me, man, is it playable or not? Like, like I'm just thinking like a one of, I'm not talking like you're going to run like a bribery type deck because it's very um like the, the line is thin there but what do you think like could you see it as a one of in the sideboard yeah for sure i mean against those big reanimator decks being able to steal their target you know especially because you're going to be playing you're putting this into a control deck you're going for the long game so playing a five mana sorcery shouldn't be that much of a problem for you yeah man and before we move on i just the nostalgia though man like i played a lot during like masks time like just kitchen table with my friends and my brother. Um, the artwork on that is like interesting, <laughs> and yeah. it's it's so cool. Like the the big dude, like looks like they're like, kind of like trading, like you know, like Mercadian Mass was kind of like that whole like pirates theme. Yeah. Um, and yeah. and well, the whole market and stuff like yes, that. yes, exactly. You yeah, know, some of the artwork in this set is like unbelievable, but Masks had a lot of underpowered cards too. But um, but cool, man. All right, what what color we got next? Uh, next is black, and I went with a creature this time, and I went with Icarid, which is mm-hmm. three and a black. Its creature type is horror. It has haste. At the end of your turn, you sacrifice Icarid. At the beginning of your upkeep, if Icarid is in your graveyard, you may remove a black creature card in your graveyard other than Icarid from the game if you do return Icarid to play, and it's a 3-1. I... We know that it sees play in Legacy. I think it sees play in Vintage still. And this card feels like it's real close, whether it be with Survival or um, Zombie Infestation. Like, it's, it seems like it's so close to just being able to, you know, f- suddenly you're getting attacked by three a 3-1 haste every single turn. Right? I, it's so close, man. Like... I, again, I don't even want to get into the whole dredge thing. Like, that, what a terrible mechanic that is. Like, so that's why like this format is great for not having that. Um, 
but yeah, that's when Icarid like really exploded once Dredge was like uh, a thing. But like, there are ways like once Icarid started becoming like like in the spotlight, like there are different ways you can probably like abuse it. I wonder if there would yeah zombie infestation when you said that like made me think like there could be a deck that is revolved around zombie infestation and Icarid like Icarid is no joke like the re- the the continued recurrence um, or reoccurrence from that is no joke. Yeah, I mean, even being able to cycle, you know, the black cyclers. Yeah. Oh, and with to, wait, and with like Evan, if you add like cabal therapy with it, that's ridiculous. Like that's like not fair. Exactly. I feel like this card, like that's why this card seems like it's that close. Like some sort of, you know, either whether it's mono black or black X, you know, mid range deck. It's it's just close enough that I feel like if somebody can figure out some way to like thread the needle here, they yep. could build a Icarid deck. Oh, that would be so sick. I would be trying to play that like anywhere. That is, that, that just sounds awesome, man. Um, I mean, you can discard it to Psychotog. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I'll probably just be like, if I had to guess, it would be like a mono black. Like you could have Putrid Imp, like, like you said, the Cyclers. I don't know. There's, there's something there. Like, even if it was like a, like even if something you brewed something, you, we're talking like tier three. Like it might win a few games. Like I don't know, but it would, it would just be sick that if there like a deck existed. That's probably a work in progress for you and I to to put together something. Yeah. Um. Let's see. My black card is Yogmoth's Agenda. So it is a three black black for an a, an enchantment. Um. You can't cast more than one spell each turn. The next text is you may play cards from your graveyard. So Yogg's Will uh, on a stick. And then if a card would be put into your graveyard from anywhere, you exile it instead. This card is, it's worded in a very interesting way. And it's really close to being broken. And I think the thing that holds it back is probably it's converted mana cost of being five mana in black. Um, I mean, you do have Dark Ritual, I get it, but like, I'm just trying to think in the format what you're going to do. But five mana, if you don't have the rituals, how are you getting there? How long is it going to take you? Especially if you're playing against like, you know, Burn, like what's your plan of action? Evan, what's one card that kind of sticks out to you that like kind of goes with it? Can you think of anything? Um, so the, immediately that pops in my head is Energy Flux. No, oh, Energy Field, Energy Field. And energy Field. That's it. And that's that's because, you know, it's a little small combo there. Yep. But other than that, I mean, you also have to remember you have to invest in your graveyard before you cast Agenda because anything you cast after Agenda is on the battlefield already, you're now exiling. Yep, completely a setup card. Like you're uh, – you, you have you, – yeah, you have to build around Agenda. You can't just like start dumping all these cards and like – um afterwards you have to like do it beforehand Um, yeah the only way i could see it happening is if you were like playing it in storm and tried to like brain freeze then play agenda and then brain freeze back out of your graveyard or something yep with the the other bad thing about it though is uh they're bad in multiples like just like it does nothing um that's another thing you probably have to run three or four if you're going to build a deck around it and drawing more than one is just like it, it's it's gonna be a feel bad. Um, you're gonna basically and even like, and even trying to play it in some sort of like mid range for value. I mean, at that point, you could be playing a card like Oversold Cemetery or something. Yeah, like that might just be a better card. Yeah, there's just better versions of you trying to grind out extra value in the mid range matchup than this card. Yeah, exactly. All right, cool. Well, what's the next one? So the next color is red, and my red card that I decided to go with was Goblin Welder, which, for people who don't know, costs one red. It's a goblin, 1-1, one, one, and you can tap it to exchange the control of tar- – like exchange target artifact a player controls with an artifact that's in their graveyard. So you can make it swap places. I'm a huge fan of Welder. It's one of my – probably my favorite red card – ever printed i would love to see it see more play i don't 100 percent know what you'd be weldering in the play right now aside from maybe trying to do some business with tangle wires because you don't have jar 
I mean, burying people under tangle wires feels pretty good. <laughs> yeah, man. <laughs> um, it feels great for you, and then your opponent is not happy. Um, yeah. I actually, so Goblin Welder, yeah, I, I feel like I've seen it in some, like, survival lists, but, like, they're not that great, in my opinion. Like, I feel like, like, the, um, like, recurring nightmare survival decks are better, and then um, the... Oh, recurring nightmare survival decks and then the um what was i saying i can't remember now but um yeah i played in the sideboard of um devour and it's it's really good i actually had that loop kind of going with tangle wire um like the tangle wire loop with mm -hmm. um i had two welders going it was it was nice um so it, it can be broken but again it's like limited it's limited to what it's broken with I mean, I could even potentially see if you were trying to play some like mono red welder list where you were using tangle wires to try to keep your opponent tapped out. And then, you know, when your tangle wire is about to die, you try to, uh, you know, like swap the, the, the dying tangle wire for a Triskelion. And now all of a sudden Triskelion's a, you know, basically a burn spell. You know, you, you pop the Triskelion, you welder it back out of play, get your, your tangle wire back in, keep your opponent constantly tapped out you know you could run you can run something like uh you know ancient tombs city of traders and stuff to try to get to your triskelion mana or just to give yourself a faster um tangle wire turn but you it's very another one a very very close one there for me anyway yeah no absolutely um all right. Anything else with Welder? Mm, I don't think so. All right. But again, I, I'm glad you said it was one of your favorite cards. The card is insanely powerful. Um, it used to like dominate like vintage back in the day. It's too slow now, unfortunately. But um, yeah, it's just probably the restriction is um, like not enough good targets. And it probably it probably is best in Devour. Like, but in the sideboard, I don't think you can play it in, this, in the main board. Um, All right, so my red card is Gamble. Um, so Gamble is one red mana uh, for a sorcery. And it says, search your library for a card and put that card into your hand. And then discard a card at random. Then shuffle your library. So it's basically a one mana tutor. Um, I don't know where it would go. Like, there's like, I've seen like lands decks. Like, but is that it? Or like Reanimator? I, I don't know. Like, Gamble is like a like skill intensive card to play especially like you can do the shenanigans where like you cast the, like let's say you're playing reanimator you can get that reanimator target in your graveyard um just by like having that last card in your hand but then you're just hoping to top deck a reanimate spell i don't know maybe there's just like not enough ways to abuse it what do you think um same thing i mean I, it, it would definitely feel at least for me most comfortable in, in that style um i mean technically it pairs very well with welder um, it also pairs well with Icarid, but I'm not, I'm not entirely sure if there's a deck that needs this card. I mean, obviously if there's a card that can fill its hand up very quickly, maybe if there was some version of like replenish and you were in, you know, Jeskai, you were in three colors, blue, white, red, and you were trying to like gamble for a squee or gamble for a you know, one of your enchantments, if you were like missing opalescence or something. Mm -hmm. But aside from that, I really, I don't know what an, like, you know, a, a hell bent in tomb would do. Yeah. It's probably why gamble sees no play. There's like no way to abuse it. Cause like it's in a card you, it's a card you should abuse and it's broken, but there's probably, there's just like no way to do it. Um, and if there is, it's like so fringe, it's like not worth it. Yeah. All right, cool. Next one. So we're moving on to green, and I went with a enchantment called Defense of the Heart, which is a green and three. And at the beginning of your upkeep, if an opponent controls three or more creatures, sacrifice Defense of the Heart and search your library for up to two creature cards and put them into play and then shuffle your library. I feel like this card is real close. I understand that the targets in this format comparatively to like legacy are not as powerful but 
you know, if your goblin's opponent manages to flood the board, you know, pretty early on, you can stick this somewhere between turn two and four, and you drop two Phantom Neshobas or an Acroma. I I don't know what they do. <laughs> yeah. Uh I guess you, it's a sideboard card, I would assume, right? You're going to bring it in against, uh, like, when it actually can trigger. Like, you're not, like you would, it would be yeah. terrible against, like, land still. Like, yeah, um, you don't want to have that as a main board card where it just sits there as a dead, you know, either a dead card in hand or a dead card on board for the whole game. Exactly. Um, yeah, again, it seems like it's so close to, like, like seeing some play. Um, but... I mean, it's, it's very close to a – a tooth and nail for this format and tooth and nail sees play in other constructed formats. But like I said, tooth and nail is also getting more powerful creatures or it's getting two creatures that combo together that are capable of winning the game in one turn, you know, Triskelion with Micaeus or Kiki Jiki and any 10 creatures it combos with. Yep. So this is just a value card versus a win condition in other formats yeah exactly it's not like it's edh where you can turn four cast at turn five like tutor up your win con and then, and then win yeah um all right yeah my green card is um a very nostalgic one i remember when i first saw this card as a, as a kid i was like this is the most powerful card i've ever seen in my life <laughs> that card is elvish piper uh it's three and a green for a one one it's an elf it has an ability of green and a tap. Put a creature card from your hand into play. Um, yeah, I was not right. It's not broken, but um, I thought it was. And it was it was fun to put huge, like I used to put like a card called, uh, I think it was Child of Gaia into play. It was like a 6-5 or 6-7, something random. And like Thorn Elemental. Um, but that's too slow in the format. But I, I do think it's broken because it's almost like your sneak attack, show and tell type card. And green, um, like I, I want to build something around it, but I think it's not play playable. Like especially with like sword and and uh, smother and dialogue edict, all that stuff. Like I don't know. Um, we think um, same thing as kind of defense of the heart, where you know you're not putting in anything that's going to instantly win the game for you. You know, it's one of those things where maybe if you went similar to like an oath route with like you know the dragon's enchantments that you might be able to, you know, cheat something out, suit it up, and suddenly you have a more, you know, threatening card. But it's one of, it's one of those things where you're, you're, it's only as powerful as the targets you can put in play. And this format doesn't have that. Yeah, exactly. And we can move on. The, the nostalgia, man, I'm going to get all upset because it's not playable. Uh, so after green, we'll move on to artifacts. And for me, I went with Cursed Totem. Cursed Totem is an artifact that costs two. And it says players cannot play any creature abilities, meaning any tap abilities, that require an activation cost. So mm -hmm. no activated abilities of creatures can be activated. I, there's a lot of creatures in a variety of decks, very wide, that this would completely hose. I mean, rebels can't do anything. I mean, the the wild mongrel decks can't really do a whole lot. I mean, it stops birds of paradise from activating for like the greedy mana decks that are leaning heavy on birds. I know, man. Um, it's strong. Probably un it's it's like I would add this to like the list of like it's underplayed. Like I would. It, like it's almost like null rod it would, like every deck should probably run well so torment script right torment script should be in basically every single sideboard um you're taking a huge risk if you don't run like two or three minimum and then uh after that null rod and curse totem follow like i think they should always be a one of or two of in your sideboards i think curse totem can like just clean off like like clean out the game against uh full english breakfast like it can just end the game if they don't have like the Octavia orangutan. Yeah, hundred percent. I mean, it just forces them to have more answers for you. You know, on top of having the graveyard hate, 
you know, if you're going after their graveyard hate, you know, with your tour mods and stuff like that, on top of then having dropping like curse totem where suddenly they can't use activated abilities, yep. that just requires them to have more answers. And eventually you're going to be able to run them out of answers, especially if you're pairing, you know, one or two copies of curse totem with, you know, two or three copies of tour mods crypts, they aren't going to have enough orangutans to answer this. One of something is going to stick here. Yep. That's true. Um, but yeah, no, Curse Totem is probably the strongest card on our entire list. Like, it does. And it the is the card that does see play currently. It right. just doesn't see a lot of play. I think right. it should be seeing more play. Yeah, like the, the power level of it, it should see, you said it should see more play and it should probably be in more sideboards. Um, all right, my artifact. So, uh, it is Marari. So, um, you want to talk nostalgia. This was like Odyssey block in a nutshell. The artwork of this, I think it was like the, uh, the front runner artwork for the set. Um, or it was the, it was the artwork for the set. Basically. Yeah, it was. Um, and it's, it's the logo of the, of, of the set Odyssey. It is Marari. So it's a five mana artifact, um, legendary artifact. Whenever you play an instant or a sorcery spell, you may pay three mana. If you do put a copy of that spell onto the stack and you may choose new targets for that copy. Evan, we were thinking, what, how do we abuse it? You mentioned you're going to go into time warp effects. So you want to kind of dive into that and what, what you think that might look like? I, I assumed we would be, you know, in a Tron because obviously it costs five mana. That's a big investment. Plus you have to pay three to copy whatever your spell is. So that's already another big investment. So I assume already we're probably going to be in a Tron-ish type list, which for me, if I'm in Tron, I'm probably playing green for crop rotation. So if you want to be a time warp and crop rotation deck, that's where I saw it going with Tron. I don't know what your win condition would be, aside from being able to just, you know, double down on your time warps and just time warp, you know, multiple times in a row. That's where I could potentially see this fitting. Yeah, like Tinker for Mirari, like it's just you got to find the win con. I that's where I'm stumped, man. Like I don't know, like where you go from there. Um, I don't I know. Mean, you know, unfortunately, you don't have like a worm coil engine or you know a steel hell kite that you can just throw on the board and then that's your finisher. Right. I mean, if you know you were trying to play like splash another third color or use like a mana rock. You could try to go for like a Neshoba or if you want to stick to your colors, you could run, um, you know, like a Triskelion and just try to grind out value with Triskelion. That's what I was thinking. Like you'd have like, um, if you're playing like a mono blue or a blue green Tron type deck, like you're gonna have Tinker, you can run master core. Like you can have those cards that like you can try to get there with, but I just don't know if it's consistent enough. And then like, is Marari even needed? Like, I just think it's such a cool card with a, a unique ability, but it's pricey and you have to build around it. And then you like, you just can't like drop Marari and then have no, no actions like next turn. Like you have to really build around it. So you need like redundant pieces. Um, but then like after that, what's your finisher, you know? So um, yeah, again, probably just not playable. And, uh, but it would, it would be awesome if there was like a, some type of Mirari deck. You could probably, you don't even have to run multiples. You can just run the one because you're running Tinker. Um, yeah, it was also legendary. So you don't want, yep, yep. you know, a ton of copies of it. So, yep, exactly. Yeah, I could see like two max at a, in a deck if you're building around Mirari. But even thinking like if you weren't building around Mirari, like I don't even know where you would drop the card in. Like that's kind of just why it's like fringe. Like, like it will probably won't see play, but it would definitely be sweet. Um, all right, man. We're moving on to the to uh, we got two left, two two types left. What's next? Yep, we're gonna go with multicolored now. And for my multicolored card, I went with Lightning Angel. And Lightning Angel costs blue, white, red, and a colorless. Its creature type is Angel. It has both flying and haste and vigilance, and it's a three four. My favorite color combination in all of Magic to play is blue, white, red. I've played it in every format I possibly can. And I'm very upset that I can't play it in pre-modern because it's just the pieces don't line up correctly. But if they do, I feel like Lightning Angel is going to be somewhere in that 75. Yeah, man. I saw um, there's like a deck, I guess people are calling it the Solution. Um, it's like a blue, right, red, 
type deck with like lightning angel but you got the mana base uh, it's so shaky i don't like i would not trust playing it as you mentioned like it's like uh it's it's gonna be hard to pull off like that's the problem like but but i do think the mana base in the format is like what kind of keeps things in check too like um i mean modern players for years were like saying like ban fetch lands because like the mana was just too easy um which is why I like a little bit of the like the like the struggle with it in this format. Like it keeps things a little bit fairer. And uh, yeah, Lightning Angel, it's so strong, but man, like that is rough because <laughs> there's gonna be times it, it might be stranded in your hand. A hundred percent. I mean, you know, you all, you do get access to all the pain lands between you know Ice Age and Apocalypse, but you only have access to one fetch. Right, which is flooded strand, and that is going to be difficult, especially in a format where you will very likely see wasteland on your opponent's side of the battlefield in somewhere between a two and a four of, and they will just a- absolutely tear through you, which is part of the reason why I think there's no Jeskai decks that exist. Yeah, it's just like that color combo too. Like you're just a, you might just be a worse land still deck. You very well could. I mean, you know, you have access. You're, you're not running any Snapcaster type stuff here. You know, you're not able to like bolt and then flashback bolt. You know, so all the stuff you have going in is all one sided. You know, it's it's kind of hard because there's not really anything with flash that you can be running, which means everything is tap out sorcery speed, mm-hmm. which is difficult because you're not playing a traditional tempo style where you're playing on your opponent's turn. And if your opponent doesn't do anything, that's when you get to, you know, flashback your draw spell or flash in your creature and that definitely hurts it but i would love to see maybe there's a way you go through land tax so that you just bypass the whole you know mana situation completely and you run land tax and then you know your first land tax trigger you just pick up all three basic land types that would be nice um (laughs) but um yeah i don't know man just like might be i don't know i just don't i wouldn't trust playing like the mana base it would be rough it would definitely be rough like i said the only way i could think you would do it maybe is with land tax and then maybe you sc- like scroll rack to try to get the extra value out you know shuffle away the basics get the extra card draw yep um so my multicolored card is to fairy's moat so um it is three white blue for an enchantment. Um, as Teferi's moat comes into play, you choose a color. And then creatures of the chosen color without flying can't attack you. Um, wait, to be honest, I don't know why. I mean, I know how the power level was on cards back then, but like choosing a color, I think they, it could have just been creatures of the chosen color without flying can't attack, or creatures without flying can't attack you. The five mana enchantment and. Uh, <laughs> it's like not and it's multicolored yeah and it's not overpowered like that first line of like choosing a color that's like probably what makes it unplayable um it could have maybe it was because they they didn't want to just make a functional reprint of moat that's definitely possible like now you're just making a five mana two color moat um but i don't know man like i mean moat barely is playable if it was in the format i honestly i mean it might see play in land still but this card like it's like the next best thing we have. So um, I guess there's like propaganda and stuff too, but like, I'm just saying like things close to moat. Um, I think it would be cool if like Lance still played this, this card, um, but it's risky, like artifact slash enchantment removals, like rampant, which is good. Um, I mean, well, I would be still need to win. Yeah. I mean, I do. I would feel sick if I was like, Oh, five mana tap out, play the fairies moat. And then goblins like, you know, out of the board, they know, like if this is like a known thing, they just like naturalize it and then attack in. That's a terrible feeling. Or red elemental blast. <laughs> <laughs> now that's terrible. Um, <laughs> yeah, that would be terrible, man. <laughs> yeah, five mana uh, to fairies moat, and they're like a pyroblast it. It's like oh uh, yeah, I'm dead. Um, well, yeah, I tapped out. Now the pile driver is gonna kill me. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Um, yeah. Yeah, it's it's a sad card, but again, I think it, it's cool because it's pushing like moat like moat's power level, but it's just not even close to being as good. But I think cool for thing. it for it to be a more realistic card, it would have to cost 
less. I think that the CMC yeah. on it definitely hurts it a lot because it's a big investment, especially because like you said, you're probably tapping out for it. You know, so for you to tap out for a Teferi's moat, it needs to lock, lock the game for its time on the battlefield. And there's a good chance that it's probably not. And especially because you're choosing a color, you know, it, there's going to be lots of matchups where it's not going to do anything. Yeah. You're just or it's much- only going to hurt like maybe two of their creatures, but the other two of their creatures are suddenly going to get through. Exactly. That's a problem. Like now you're facing flyers. It's like, well, that doesn't do anything. Um, Or you're playing, you know, blue green threshold and suddenly they discard and change the color of wild mongrel and go, sure. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Right. Um, Yeah. That's also a problem. Um, The other thing too, is like humility, humility is just like a thousand times better. So, um, all right, cool, man. What's next. So after the multicolored cards, we have lands which is going to be towards the the very end of our list. My land that I chose was Core Haven, which if you guys are not sensing a theme here, there is one. I tried to avoid it, but it happened. So Core Haven is a legendary land, taps for one colorless mana, and for a colorless and a white and tapping it, you can prevent all combat damage that will be dealt by target attacking creature this turn. So you can fog a creature. I think this could slide into lots of different decks all across the board. It's not like there's anything that has protection from lands. Right. (laughs) Being able to fog your opponent's biggest creature or their main creature seems incredibly powerful, especially if they don't have a way to deal with Core Haven. Yeah, I don't... It's like... Yeah, I'm surprised. I think, like, I could see, like, a a Rebels deck playing it... um... Because I, I don't, I think Stoneforge decks like back in the day would play one of these. I don't know if it was like in Legacy, like they would play this in like Tower of Magistrate. But um, yeah, Corehaven, man, it's like it's such a strong card. I just wonder why. It like, saw it's, some play in Maverick as just an option to be able to fog your opponent's, you know, show and tell or reanimate target. Right. Um, it was also in miracles i believe in some lists that were strictly blue white that were not playing red again for the same reason because it was able to fog you know your opponent's gristle brands and stuff like that yeah i mean like one of uh, like as a one of just a utility land like i'm, just, I'm surprised it has like I, I don't think i've ever seen it in a list um and, and unlike maze of it this also doesn't attack it or uh, i'm sorry untap it and then like remove it from combat oh, so true, this literally true. just this literally just fogs it so it yep. stays tapped you know, yep. being able to core haven your opponent's lethal, um, you know, goblins or something like that, you know, his biggest goblin that he's attacking with seems great. You know, there's click slither or something like that. No, it's true. Yeah, that's that's one to explore, man. I want to keep my eye on that one. Um, not that it's going to, it's not going to break the format wide open, but it's just like a, a, an interesting utility land that like, could we slot it in somewhere? I think there's definitely an, a chance um and then um to wrap this up the final card on my list uh for lands is high market so it is a land from mercadian masks um two abilities first one is add one colors tap it add one colorless mana to your mana pool second one is tap it and sacrifice a creature you gain one life um This type of ability, like Diamond Valley, like it's it's abused in like EDH, and uh, like I wonder what kind of home it would have in the format, um, like an aristocrat style type deck, but I, like almost like Phyrexian Altar, like, um, like I don't know if there's like a type of deck where you'd want to be sacrificing things to get value. I don't know if that is like exists. Like I guess like a goblin a goblin bombardment deck with high market and like Phyrexian Altar, but that doesn't seem good. That seems like a lot of setup. And then like what, what's coming out of it? Like you might just be dead by the time you're trying to do all this stuff. Well, right off the bat for me, and I only know this cause I run it is Academy Rector. Oh, right, right. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I'm surprised I didn't even think about that. And being able to sacrifice your Academy Rector on turn five, you play it. This only activation cost of this card is sacking a creature and tapping it. You don't have to invest any mana. So whether it's off of an ancient tomb, a city of traders, whatever it is, you play your Academy Rector 
and then you immediately sacrifice it to high market and then you're potentially off to the races with whatever you're getting with Rector. Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, I guess, I don't know, maybe. Yeah, I mean, it's best spot probably that you're right because I don't think there's like an aristocrat style type of deck out there. I think that uh, it would just, it would match good with Rector. Um, like there's card, there's already cards out there. Like there's like pattern Rector and stuff like that. Like I feel like there's a version that could probably run a high market or two. Um, and it's hard to interact with too. So it's, it's definitely viable in my opinion. Yeah. I mean, it, it, for me, I see it more as a very cheap sack outlet versus something where you're looking to gain life. Yeah. I mean, you know, you could, if you wanted to try to run it in like an unearth deck, you could like sacrifice your meddling mage to reset your meddling mage card with like unearth. But aside from that, I don't really see, unless it's being super abused as, you know, a death trigger, I don't know what else you're doing with high market. Yeah, it would just, probably not too many things that you can abuse it with. That's the, that's like the biggest thing. It's, it's mainly Rector, but again, you're like, um, it was like a two card combo you're trying to pull off. Uh, um, and maybe like the earliest is turn four, if you can ramp out the Rector. Eh. It would be cool though, because again, it's hard to interact with besides like a stifle effect. But, um, but yeah, that that wraps up uh, that section. I know you and I had this idea for a while, so we thought it would be cool to kind of go over it. Um, I will say though, out of the entire list, um, besides the one that see a little bit of play already, like like Cursed Totem and Goblin Welder, um, the one that stands out to me is on your list, and it's Icarid. I think it would be so sick if a Icarid type deck would be viable. And I, I think we should take the time when we have it to explore that, that, you know, what that foundation might look like for an Ecker deck. Yeah, for sure. Um, all right, sweet man. And then uh, one more thing we wanted to jump into um, was doing a quick deck tech and some, um, a niche card we added in um, to blue, white, black stifle knot. Um, so, pull this up real quick. So here is the list. Um, I went 4-0 in the Mythic Society tournament with it. Um, it's my style, like that tempo control slash got combo finish. I mean, Friction Dreadnought is not a fair card. Like it's, it's a combo. Um, but Evan, you brought up on earth when I was showing you, like we were talking about like the tiers and like talking about deck list. I feel like you were just staring at the screen and you're like, wait a second. Um, on Earth looks like it would fit well in here. <laughs> um, yeah. <laughs> you, want, you want to go over that? And then um, I can kind of run down like just like a, a deck tech of Stifle Knot. Yeah. I mean, I've always been a fan of Unearth as a card. And if there's any way I can try to play it, I will always try to play it. But being able to, you know, reanimate for one mana and, and not lose life or anything being able to unearth your your dreadnoughts after your opponent you know diabolic edicted you or whatever it is and it's in your graveyard seems crazy powerful and then the other thing that we realized which i had mentioned earlier is you know your meddling mages you can sacrifice your meddling mage to cabal therapy and then unearth your meddling mage and mm -hmm. reset your meddling mage on a separate card or the same card just to get your your therapy through um and then um, you had mentioned post sideboard, you get access to unearthing your mother of runes. Yep. That's... You know, so you, you know, you <laughs> tap your mother of runes to give your dreadnought protection or whatever it is, and then they kill your mother of runes. You can then unearth your mother of runes back out. Yeah, that's that's absurd. Um, it's and cycling cards are like, I know cycling was like kind of brought up again i don't know if it was in a standard format or was it edh i can't remember what it was but cycling cards are so like so powerful like almost like um like under the radar powerful like it's a it's a card when if a card has cycling if it has no use it replaces itself to draw a card like that's ridiculous and then you can it's, do it at instant speed too um it's never dead it's, exactly like it makes it so even in a situation where you are ne you know you're playing against a swords deck where you're never going to get to unearth anything yeah. you're still able to just cycle unearth as a draw spell absolutely and then it's like unearth is perfect here um because 
like the fact that you can cast a rest or cabal therapy or peak, you can see what's up Then you can like run out your dreadnought like into their removal. If you don't have like the meddling mage or you, you, they had more than one, you can't pull both. Sometimes you're going to have those redundant copies of stifle and vision charm. So you can run out the dreadnought. They're going to be forced to kill it. And then you can unearth it and then use that second stifle or vision charm to, to get your dreadnought. It's like safe again. Um, it's got a lot of utility Again, as you mentioned, like the meddling mage aspect, like that's ridiculous with cabal therapy. Um, and then meddling mage, like that is semi broken in my opinion. Um, cause you can just basically lock them out of what they were trying to do. Um, and they actually might have a hard time interacting with what you're doing. So very, very good tech adding on earth. And, um, I, I think it's, it's smart. Um, and then I'll, I'll just run down the deck real quick. So, um, the combo pieces are the stifled. Uh, I mean, the stifles, the vision charms with the dreadnought. Um, the I'm going to tell you, this is the best days deck in the format. It is ridiculous because this deck kind of plays like Delver. Um, and that is like my bread and butter. So yeah, day, this is the best days deck in the format, in my opinion. Um, because you can like, like days is perfect on turn two. Like you don't really want to like be turn one using a days because you're going to be, you're going to fall behind, but like, the turn two days in this deck is absolutely absurd. And then um, like, I like two mana leaks um, as just like the hard counter basically, because in this deck, it really is like games aren't going long post board there. They run a little different. I'll get into that, but not game one. Um, and then like duress, probably the best card in the format followed by cabal therapy, probably the most skill intensive deck. I mean, card in the format um, meddling mage, is top five most skill intensive cards in the format, in my opinion. And I know you and I talked about it, but you need to know what to name and when to do it correctly. Um, Meddling of Age is like very hard to play. Um, I mean, you're going to, obviously there's going to be easy times where you can duress them and like, oh, now I know. So turn to Meddling Mage, but in the blind, um, very skill intensive. Uh, I put Limdul's Vault here in the little tutor package because each tutor is your package to find Dreadnought. Um, also comes in handy too, when you want to find seal of cleansing, but Limdul's vault is basically a tutor. Um, it's two mana instant speed and you're just looking for the piece you need. I know when you saw that card too, it stuck out to you. You're like, Oh wait, that's like, <laughs> it's almost like vampire. It's like basically vampiric tutor. Yeah. yeah it's um, this format's legal vampiric. Yep. Exactly. Um, talked about unearth already. Love it. And I'm keeping them in there. Uh, peak fantastic. Those that's where we made the room for unearth. We cut two peaks. Um, four just seemed like it's okay. It's obviously good with cabal therapy, but I, I like two. and then seal of cleansing is just good utility. So like I put these as like our little flex options here, even though I probably wouldn't cut these, but for metagame options, you can use like this, this like five card package here. Cause I don't think you want to touch anything here to the left. And then the sideboard, um, mother ruins, um, against like the, any decks with, with removal. Um, I had one game where to turn one mom, and they couldn't do anything. So um, once you get to untap with with mom, it's like over. Um, swords for the mirror or just like any creatures that might be annoying. Um, seal is just like one of the best just enchantment artifact removal in the format. Chill. Uh, do not bring this in against goblins. Um, that's not good against goblins. Um, it's really good against burn though. It's basically like... <laughs> Double sphere resistance against burn. Um, brought it in against burn. They couldn't beat it. Um, Engineer plague. That's what you want against goblins. And then Tormach crypt. Obviously, in my opinion, you need three Tormach crypt minimum in every deck, almost unless you are like a really fast combo deck, like Angry Hermit or something. But um, yeah, man. That like I said, I want to just do a quick rundown after we talked about on Earth. Um, sweet. Anything else you want to add about the deck, or before we wrap up? Um, no, I mean the other nice part about bringing in engineering plague and like any of the like the lower numbers like chill and stuff like that is that they're also tutorable with e tutor and and limb duels vault also post sideboard. Yeah, man, I think I told you um, again like this plays like Delver, so like I I only played Siphon not once and I went four zero and I I didn't think like like obviously there's luck involved in all games of Magic there's variance but I felt like I've done this before because it plays just like Delver. And what I did was game two and three for most games, usually game two, if I won game one, but most games I'm boarding out three to four pedals 
and I'm going to board in more of like the control elements. So like mother runes, um, the seals, the engineering plagues, like you become more of a control combo deck, I guess, if you want to name it like that. But, um, well, you want yeah. to make your deck more sustainable. Exactly. Yeah. 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 Like I played, I think I can't remember which deck I was playing against. I think it was against replenish. Um, I basically became like the control deck because they are like, they are way, way above like the combo realm of what this deck is doing. So I was like, all right, I'm just going to play the control deck. So I bored out the pedals. I um, think I bored out the Lindell's vault and I bored out the unearths. And then I brought in, um, I think I brought in the seals, the Tormod crypt and the mother of runes. And I just played a control deck and I like won on turn like eight and they couldn't do anything. So um, I controlled the board. Basically I had protection from my dreadnought. Once I felt comfortable doing it, I went off and then they couldn't beat it. So, um, this deck is like one of the best, especially if, if, if in a strong hand, like a strong pair of hands, uh, I'm sure you would agree with that too. Like this deck is like hard to play just like Delver is Delver is really hard to play in like legacy. Um, it's not just like, oh, flip your Delver swing. Like you need to know when to use your days, which is in here. Um, you have to use Meddling Mage and Cabal Therapy. And I was just going to say, you, you know, Meddling Mage and Cabal Therapy, you already talked about being, you know, very skill intensive, knowledge dependent cards. And you're running both of them in multiple quantities in here. And you need to know, you know, what's going on in the format on top of what's going on in your opponent's deck whether it's from hand disruption, peak, whatever it is, that you need to know what are the problem cards that I can't deal with in this deck before you even go, you know, you're deep into the matchup. Absolutely, man. I'm telling you, man, Cabal Therapy in the entire game, top five, like the entire game of Magic, top five most skill intensive cards. Um, it's just like, I think it's a little underrated and it's used incorrectly a lot of the time, but the card is, it's so powerful. It's ridiculous. Um, but yeah, and I said in the format though too, I think this is the most skill intensive one. And then that would be a good breakdown we can do is like a, the most skill intensive cards, like top five, but Meddling Mage probably is top five. Um, but yeah, this deck is so much fun. Um, you're going to have the variance though when like you just don't draw your pieces, but a lot of redundancy with like E-Tutor, basically it's Dreadnought um, five, six, seven, and eight. Um, but yeah, man, I like it. If I went to like a big tournament, like if this, you know, Pre-COVID, um, if we had a paper tournament, I would probably bring Stifle Knot. I would, I would feel comfortable. Um, I just think it's like really well-tuned, especially the Unearth. I love the two Unearths, man. So I'm glad you brought that up because um, they, they came in handy a few times and they it's more than just like, oh, let me Unearth my Dreadnought. Like, no, there's more synergy here. And uh, I think two is like perfect for the deck and it fits in like like wonderfully, so... Um, yeah, man, wanted to share that too. Um, so I guess we'll wrap up now. Um, we actually have a few other ideas that we want to do, so we might get another podcast in before September's over. So we'll keep everyone posted. Um, and then, uh, yeah, I guess we're ready to sign off. Evan, have a good night, man. And, and I'll talk to you on the next one. Have a good night, everybody. See you next time.